the share. And let's see if I can get Mr. Tar. All right. <clears throat> do, 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 do. <clears throat> hey, everybody on the stream. Uh, Jim, we're, we are live on the stream. Uh, we're not recording this just yet, but uh, so this won't appear in the, in the final product until we actually start the show. Okay. But <clears throat> we go Someone live. Someone could be uh, listening. Oh, yes. Yes. If we're on the <laughs> Facebooks right now. <laughs> like okay. and share that. And there we go. Let me go to my page and share that out. Let's see. How to do a what? Oh, I don't know. Can, can we not do that during the show? <laughs> okay. Oh, this is your new computer that's like... Ooh, ooh. Well, if it dies of heat stroke during the show, we'll know what the problem was. Okay, well, that's good. In fact, um, Suncast, I, I need to... Uh, if, if not during the show or after the show, sometime in the next 24 hours, I'll need to ask you about... Uh, some NVIDIA um, video cards. They seem to make a bazillion of them. Ah, Chris Tarr may be having to check in. He is uh, on his way home now. He was getting some sites ready for Snowmageddon. There is snow on the ground where i am but i presume not where you are kirk um hang on just a second let me uh share this to toward um no there's no there's no snow here and and the forecast <laughs> keeps getting uh weaker and weaker for snow and bad weather for my I'll area be there right right away <laughs> I'm not saying there's going to be none. I'm just saying it keeps getting a, a little wimpier forecast. Yeah. Well, you know, it's already January. It could be. I, I knock on wood every time I say it, but when winter's over, it could seem short up here. <clears throat> and we'll take it. All righty. Let's see about... Uh... Got to share this out to one more place. We're almost to airtime. We don't have to start our time, but it's nice to do so. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's share this over to uh, the Broadcasting Club. They seem to like it over there. Mm -hmm. And I get to mention your name. All right. Host that. <clears throat> Well, um, Suncast, as you um, surmised, looks like we'll have a double box, not a triple box, uh, until uh, Chris shows up. Hang on. Keep it out of the ditches, brother! Exclamation point. All right. How's that? Ah. <sighs> It's top of the hour. Hey, everybody on the network. We're glad you're here. We're about to start this week in Radio Tech. Uh, and um, let me just get my stuff to you. Let's see. What am I having to drink here? Oh, it's some energy drink. That's what it is. All right. Tequila flavored energy drink. No. That's for after the show. Um, <clears throat> sure, I've got enough notes here. Man. Uh, 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 uh. Do, 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 do. Go to sent mail. Here we go. All righty. Okay. <clears throat> mm. 
Sorry, a lot of throat clearing here. I promise you, we're getting ready. We're going to do a show here any second now. Um, thanks for joining us on the network live. Glad you're here. We're going to do a uh, our 678th episode of This Week in Radio Tech. Um, Chris Tarr is trying to get in, but he is on the road uh, getting ready for Snowmageddon. And so he was... Uh, he was going to be here for sure, but uh, yeah, the, the weather changed his plans a bit. We'll see if he can check in during the show. And I, I know that Suncast, our producer, will uh, will let us know, and I'll have the chat box open, uh, Mr. Suncast. All right, here we go with episode 678 in three, <laughs> two. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from uh, the microphone to that light bulb at the top of the tower, and sometimes the uh, ugh, the amazing precipitation that we get in association with weather systems that come through and, uh, and affect our broadcasting. We try not to let it affect, but sometimes it does. Hey, I'm Kirk Harnack in the Telos Alliance studio in nashville tennessee and uh it's a it's a bit a good day here in nashville and weather wise it's a little chilly we're, well no it's not too bad actually we're up to 54 degrees now it's going to get a lot colder here and maybe a little snow over the weekend um chris tar hopefully he'll be checking in as i said he's getting ready for snowmageddon and uh, he's been getting a few sites, uh, you know, make sure that they're ready to go. Generators are tested. Uh, everything is, is, is as ready as it can be for uh, when they maybe can't get to the sites or not easily. So we wish Chris well, and maybe he'll be checking in during the show. Meanwhile, our guest is with us, and he's also up in the uh, usually frozen north, and that is Jim Offerdahl. Jim, welcome in. It's good to see you on the show. Hi, Kirk. Thanks uh, for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. And when I say you're up in places that are often frozen, uh, where would you be coming to us from? Well, I am in the city of Faustin, Minnesota. And for those who, and probably most don't know exactly where that is, we're about 120 miles from the Canadian border. And we're uh, about... Uh, Oh, 80 miles from the North Dakota border on U.S. Highway 2. And if you look at the map of Minnesota, uh, Highway 2 runs from Grand Forks to the southwest to Duluth. So we're a little closer to North Dakota than uh, Lake Superior, but we're up in the frozen north, that's for sure. Oh, and, and actually, right now, I just checked when you brought up temperature. Uh, let's see, it's four degrees here. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. <laughs> and let's wow. see how cold it's going to get tonight. Uh, we're going to get to, uh, oh, maybe four below, seven below the next night, nine below the next night, 13 below Saturday and uh, Sunday and Monday. So it's going to be cold, but it's actually been very nice. Uh, like I said, uh, in our warm up, uh, uh, it, it, it could feel like a short winter. I, I don't want to, uh, um, uh, risk my luck, but uh, saying that, but I did. So we'll we'll hope that uh, the the weather continues to hold. We don't have a lot of snow. Uh, normally, we have maybe one to two feet of snow on the ground by this time of year. So we're quite happy that uh, we don't have that. Uh, I I like a little snow. Grew up in it, but uh, it's nice to have roads that are ice free and sidewalks that aren't slippery. So. You know, if you head just a little bit west over to, say, Minot, uh, North Dakota, uh, they're down below mm -hmm. zero over there. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Uh, Montana yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We go straight down Highway 2 to Montana and service clients out there. Yeah. It's even a little chilly way down south in the Brownsville, Texas. They're looking at about 78 right now and Miami 72. So that's, uh, wow. I mean, it's, it's probably pretty normal for them, but still. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, I just... Uh, spoke with someone that came home from Florida the other day and said it was cool and I'll be down there in February. So uh, I hope it warms up a little bit there, but uh, you know, it'll be warmer than it is here. I, my, uh, my wife is from the Dominican Republic and I checked on the temperature there yesterday and it was a nice 84 degrees. So, Oh, that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, can't go yet, but we, we, we will be. Hey, well, uh, as I said, welcome mm -hmm. into the show. Jim Offerdahl is our guest today. Chris Tarr uh, was, is scheduled to be in, in, uh, at home in his home studio, but he's, like I said, been getting ready for Snowmageddon, so we'll see if Chris can show up. Hey, uh, we're going to get into it with Jim Offerdahl in a few minutes. Jim does engineering across uh, the, the cold climate of uh, Minnesota and North Dakota and a few other places, and we're going to be talking to Jim about uh, doing a good job with engineering and, and keeping not only clients happy, 
radio stations. But <clears> that, in turn, makes the radio stations reliable for their listeners. Uh, Jim, uh, is, I got to talk to Jim for about an hour yesterday, and it was just a delightful conversation. And it's, it's, it's you know, when I talk to Jim and the, the attitude that Jim has uh, about broadcast engineering, I'm reminded a lot of our friend Mark Persons and his attitude about broadcast engineering. So I think there's a lot of similarities there, and there probably probably should be. That mindset seems to come with a lot of folks in that part of the country, and I think it's refreshing and, and good. So we're going to have a good conversation with Jim coming up. This Week in Radio Tech uh, is brought to you in part by Nautel, and I want to mention to you very quickly that Nautel uh, really supports our broadcast industry with a lot of education, uh, seminars, webinars, uh, white papers, videos, things like that. And I'll go ahead and talk about their GV series of transmitters. In fact, the new GV2 series of transmitters, uh, they have some real technology enhancements in the GV2. It's the successor to the GV series, like a new IQ interface card, a new HTML AUI that is built in now. Uh, you get an embedded compute engine with 10 times more processing power than before. And that means you can have an Omnia processor built in to the Nautel GV2. How about that? Uh, it has optimized power supplies. They are really slick, a nice design. Solid state storage inside. So if you get disconnected from the rest of the world, <laughs> you can still keep transmitting your radio station. And they have a virtualization in there as, as well. Ask your uh, Nautel rep about how that works. Um, uh, just so many good benefits. Also, you can just plug uh, audio into it and get FM and HD. So everything you need to do HD is also built into this transmitter. And that is really cool. And that also means, by the way, that you don't get the drift between your HD1 and your FM signal. You set it once, you forget it, and it works fantastic. Oh, Livewire goes into it as well with no additional hardware needed. So check it out from Nautel, the Nautel GV2. Really appreciate Nautel uh, supporting and sponsoring not only This Week in Radio Tech, but also us as engineers in the broadcast industry. If you get kind of plugged in the Nautel, uh, you can look good, be smart for your uh, your radio station clients or your radio station. All right, uh, Jim Offerdahl is our guest. Jim, um, I, do I have to address you as the Honorable Jim Offerdahl, uh, seeing your, no. uh, your, political, <laughs> your political position? Tell me about that. Well, first of all, I don't consider it a political position. I am mayor of my hometown of Faustin, Minnesota, and have been awesome. since 2006. <laughs> yeah, and uh, have served on the city council since uh, 2002 when I was first elected to that. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's the town I grew up and, and was raised in, uh, uh, lived away for about 17 years, came home, and uh, never had any idea that I would get involved in anything like that as uh, life progressed. but. Uh, uh, the opportunity came up, and I took it, and I, I do have a lot of fun uh, doing it. It's my way of giving back to the public. I never served in the military, and, and I'd never served on any boards or committees of any substance before that. But uh, now for uh, over 20 years, I've given that uh, service to my hometown of about a little over 1,400 people. And Faustin's a wonderful town, and if anyone ever happens to be driving through uh, on U.S. Highway 2, uh, look me up, and I'll give you the mayor's tour. Okay. Well, now, hey, listen, uh, as, since you and I talked yesterday, I had a little chat with your opponent, and he said you only won because you're over-modulating. Is that true? Yeah, well, uh, that, that I was pretty loud. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're the, you, you are the second um, mayor that we've had as a guest on the show because yeah. Alex Roman, who's a chief engineer in New York City, market number one, yeah. uh, he, uh, until recently, actually, until about six months ago, uh, he was the mayor of Verona Township, New Jersey. So wow. uh, yeah. we're delighted to, to you know, we'll, we'll see if we can have a mayor on every year. How about that? There you go. Well, and, and I know uh, I, I can think of a station owner here in Minnesota that's also uh, his own engineer, and he's served on the city council of his community for many years. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, maybe they go hand in hand. Uh, it, it, I think it's a pretty small club. People who are uh, uh, broadcast engineers and mayors. <laughs> That's probably yeah. There you go. I, probably <laughs> probably pretty limited. As we I know, broadcast I'm, engineers are pretty limited too. So yeah, yeah, makes the makes it yeah. Uh -huh. So, so um, Jim, back in the in the early to mid eighties, uh, I 
uh, hung out my shingle as a mm-hmm. as a contract engineer. Uh, engineer, mm-hmm. I ended up, uh, gee, over a ten about a ten or eleven year period building up a business. We ended up engineering for about. I'm, you know, not full time engineering for a hundred stations, but we we answered to about a yeah. hundred radio stations. I guess yeah. probably you know mm. uh, fifteen or so, you know, that considered us, you know, their their regular. We would stop by and right. and do regular maintenance. Yep. Uh, what was it that turned you onto the idea of not working for one station, but you know, working for I don't know twenty, <laughs> thirty, forty, fifty, sixty stations? What? How how did you get into this business of contract engineering? Contract engineering. Well, a good segue from your uh, uh, introduction of me when you brought up Mark Persons. Um, Mark Persons set me up on a blind date with a gentleman that had taken over as an interim manager of a radio station that had known each other for quite some time. And that gentleman wanted Mark to do his work in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And Mark uh, decided that that was a little far for him to travel and give good support uh, from Brainerd, but he happened to know this uh, young uh, buck at the time that didn't know a whole lot, but uh, Mark was teaching him, and and uh, he uh, set uh, uh, that fellow and myself up at a blind date at a transmitter site in a little community in Minnesota called Nimrod. And I really uh, say that as it, it is the truth. He introduced us, and he, he didn't tell me what he was up to uh, when I came. I, I don't know if he told... Jack was his name, uh, That what he was up to there either, but uh, he, he basically uh, pointed to me and said, this is the guy you want to have do the work. And I go, really? Well, gee, I'm not a contract engineer. And I remember going home and talking to my wife and, and uh, struggling with the thought of doing that a bit, but uh, before long decided I'd give it a try. So first client in Grand Forks, North Dakota in 2005, I'd been an employee engineer for the then owners of the radio station here in Faustin for a few years and and uh, uh, decided to give it a try and, and now have expanded that to radio stations throughout uh, uh, central northern Minnesota and uh, most of North Dakota. In fact, my son and I have done some work at a 10,000-foot uh, peak in uh, the uh, Sierra Mountains in California. Uh, you're very unique uh, situation there, but uh, mm-hmm. so so we get around a little bit. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I was going to ask if you travel much to do engineering work outside of your regular area, um, and obviously you, you do some of that. How do you how do you decide to answer yes or no when somebody either in your area or somebody way outside your area uh, says, "Hey, I've got something that maybe you can do." How do you make that decision? <sighs> well, <laughs> uh, it's hard to say no. Yeah. Uh, so I evaluate their situation, and if they really, truly need me, uh, we've we've really always gone. Went to one that was a drive, uh, considered still in our immediate service territory, and that will will drive there. The only one that we've uh, done outside of driving and flown to is this uh, one out in California. But uh, that was a, a one-off trip, and we may go back sometime. But there's local guys out there that are supporting them. Um, but it, it's hard to say no, especially when it's within a driving distance. My rule has become as long as we can drive to the site uh, within a day's drive, we'll, we'll consider it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to say no to someone that's desperate and needs transmitters fixed and put back on the air. Uh, and uh, that's happened. So uh, the answer is I can't say no. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to guess that for your regular clients, if you're anything like like I was when I was a contract engineer, and like I guess most are now, if it's your regular client, uh, no matter what's wrong, you're going to take a stab at it and probably get the job done. You you also probably know your limitations and know when it's time to call somebody else in. But uh, it, you know, confirm or deny that su- supposition. But also. How? What? What do you consider your real strengths? Like, if somebody calls out of your area and says, "I need help with X," and your answer is, "I know exactly how to take care of that for you, and I'm I'm really good at it, and I'll be out there," versus, you know, well, you know, I'm, that's not really our in our wheelhouse. Well, at this point in time, um, you know, back in the in the early days, there was a lot of uh, limits, and that was one of the things that my mentor, Mark uh, Persons, uh, taught me was know your limit, Jim. If you're not sure, you give me a call anytime, day or night. 
I'll get out of bed if you're out of the site. And of course, uh, there was a lot of that back 20 years ago, a little less these days because more and more clients are getting backups and, and it's not as urgent then. But uh, uh, so so very true on, on knowing your limits. And uh, um, yeah, um, in any case, uh, uh, that's... Uh, uh, something I learned long ago. Now today, um, mm-hmm. uh, it's a little different. Um, my expertise, and I and, and I should say that you know I have my son who's been working uh, with me for ten years, and he's still learning as I was ten years, and I'm still learning. I, I you know, when you're young, you think you know it all, and then you get a little older, and you realize you <laughs> never just, will know it all, never, and know. <laughs> uh, that's just a fact of life. But uh, so. Uh, I feel like with uh, uh, the fellow, my son and Mark Anderson, who works uh, for us, uh, uh, we've got a good team that that can get just about anything done in broadcast engineering. Uh, Limits uh, uh, end up with uh, maybe some more complicated uh, AM broadcast systems, but I'm pretty AM savvy. Uh, uh, For example, uh, uh, I work with... uh, a uh, number of directionals uh, supporting them uh, uh, as as a 20 year old uh, engineering veteran haven't built a new directional so I haven't built one from the ground up but we've rebuilt some and when wow. we've done that we call in the experts uh, to do the tune up uh, uh, so so uh, in a case like that uh, we'll we'll call in someone for that but honestly uh, I'm trying to think of uh, it's rare when uh, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, we uh-huh. had a transmitter, uh, solid state, that needed some pretty major disassembly, and it and and the client didn't have a backup transmitter, oh. and I've never disassembled this relatively new, maybe twenty years old, and in the world of AM radio, that's relatively new, but I've never taken one completely apart, and it needed to be pretty well disassembled to do the repair, and I was afraid of that because again, no backup. And I thought, what's going to happen if I get in deep and find out it's going to... I worked out a very uh, uh, um, worthwhile deal with the manufacturer to send a service tech up to that had done it. And uh, there's probably one other case where in the years past, I got into a situation where I just wasn't comfortable uh, you know, and it, in particular, the mechanical aspect of it, uh, you know, taking a uh, hundred screws out, and making sure you know how to get the uh, assembly out without damaging it, that kind of thing. So uh, otherwise, we don't do towers. I don't climb towers. You do. I don't. Um, but uh, so we work with uh, some good tower crews in the area for that kind of thing. But uh, the rest, uh, we pretty much do it all. Yeah, I, I don't officially climb towers, and I, I used to pretty regularly, you know, scamper up to check something or uh, carry something lightweight up the side of the tower, N- nothing heavy. Uh, actually, yeah. almost only once uh, did I ever even use a uh, a, a a pulley uh, block and tackle at the at the top of the tower or at, at wherever we were pulling something mm-hmm. up to. Uh, the rest of the time, it's you know, if I if I couldn't you know, throw it on my belt and carry it up myself. I wasn't going to do it. Um, it's amazing. Back before I knew about safety equipment, you know, my my uh, uh, my safety device to to go around the tower and 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 uh, and and cinch off there was a a, a piece of ski rope. So that oh probably wasn't wasn't the safest <laughs> thing around. I, I got well, the whole harness now, you know, and the hard hat and you know and all that kind of stuff. But I, I rarely use it. Well, I'll, t- I'll tell you a little story that uh, now you've probably gone up to some pretty good heights. I, th- I think you have. I've gone uh, up a tower um, uh, since I've been in broadcast engineering to maybe 100 feet. But I decided mm-hmm. uh, uh, probably a decade or better ago that I was too old to keep doing that. Uh, so the professionals are called for that. But in my younger days, prior to my broadcast uh, engineering uh, career uh, and, and I've spent my whole life really in uh, electronics technical service. Uh, ran a consumer electronics uh, business and and uh, ended up doing uh, uh, television reception systems. Started with and it, and it it's towers for consumers. And so I used to stack uh, self supporting towers, sixty eight, sixty four feet to the top. I think if I remember, and put antennas yeah. on them. That's it. Uh, never gone up much higher than than that. Uh, actually, putting a tower up, but uh, 
uh, I think once or twice, uh, maybe up to a hundred feet on one that I remember when I, since I've been an engineer, but not going to do that anymore. That's for the guys that know what they're doing, have the tools and are well-trained. <laughs> So we're talking to Jim Offerdahl of Offerdahl Broadcast Services uh, and Engineering Services in uh, in uh, Faustin. Uh, did I get that right? Faustin? You did. Perfect. Faustin, yes. Minnesota. Everyone uh, thinks that it, I say Boston when they yeah, when I say it. it but no, it's close. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's close. <laughs> hey, well, so so we've gotten to know Jim a, a little bit, and we're going to do a, take a quick uh, uh, commercial break to hear from one of our sponsors. But when we come back, um, I want to hear from Jim more about like his areas of expertise. What advice? Uh, what stories he might have in in repairing this, or what he learned from repairing <laughs> that, or coming upon a situation where we can get Jim to st- share some uh, you know some hard-earned knowledge with us that may save you or me some trouble next time we come across uh, a similar situation. And I know that uh, between Jim and his crew, they've got uh, plenty of, of experiences. And, you know, it, it's, it's nice when you can say, well, I learned about, you know, some I learned something about this from that. Also, Jim, uh, later on in the show, is going to have a pretty cool announcement for us. Uh, we're going to drop a name here later on in the show that um, I think you're going to want to hear about. So hang on. Stay tuned. Our show this week in radio tech is brought to you in part by our friends over in england at broadcast bionics and i love these people they are so clever so smart and they make the coolest stuff for radio broadcasters um, to make your radio so much better to make your programming better and to give us engineers uh make us look good when we install this stuff let's check it out and hear this word from broadcast bionics tips of a production team in radio, TV and podcast. Our workflow-led system is working 24-7 around the world for small broadcasters and national and international networks. Our telephony module, Bionic Talk Show, allows cost-effective centralization, remote operation, scalability and resilience across an entire network of stations, but at the same time is used in single studio self-op environments. Social media curation and activity is now considered a broadcast critical part of programming. Bionic Social means the studio isn't overwhelmed with a wall of interaction from an ever-growing number of social platforms. We combine SMS, MMS and email together with a speech-to-text service for listeners using smart speakers. We enable studio teams to curate, filter and display all platforms in one place and post text, images and video content to multiple platforms in one operation. Effortless collection of video content with Bionic Director has helped position some of the world's most successful stations as leaders in viral content, generating appointments to listen and free marketing via retweets and shares. Bionic Contest enables end-to-end tracking of on-air competitions, live reads and prizes. These could be on-air contests, automated SMS entry or online. Anywhere and Skype TX for Radio brings high quality audio and video contribution into the studio with ease. No need for dedicated PCs to run different applications. Everything is controlled within the Bionic Studio UI and incoming connections are visible to users along with all other platforms. Our codec integration enables connection, algorithm configuration and directory to a wide range of IP and ISDN codecs. The Bionic Studio, a unique suite of products designed to enable your talent to work smarter. Love this stuff from Broadcast Bionics, including the Camera One system, uh, their phone system, the phone one. They make all kinds of uh, software and other gear that works with uh, Telos Alliance gear. Uh, you saw in, in their video there uh, a, a, a an Axia Fusion console. Of course, it works with the uh, new Axia Quasar console a, as well. Love this stuff, and I really mean that. I've been to their facility, their development and uh, uh, programming facility over in England, and uh, what what a great bunch of, uh, of people there. And they take their equipment and software out to radio stations, big stations in the UK, BBC, for example, Global Radio, uh, Bauer, uh, and um, just uh, and t- test it out, make it better so that you and I can benefit from that. So check it out from Broadcast Bionics at bionic.co.uk or bionics.co.uk. Their links are in our show notes. Thanks a lot.
All right. Hey, we're talking to Jim Offerdahl on This Week in Radio Tech. Uh, Chris Tarr may be along if he can uh, scoot on home through the snow there near McWanago, Wisconsin. We hope uh, he's uh, okay <laughs> and you know, keeps it between the ditches. Um, I'm Kirk Harnack in Nashville, Tennessee, and Jim Offerdahl is here from uh, Faustin, Minnesota. Jim, I wonder if you could uh, spend the next few minutes sharing with us some engineering wisdom. What are some of the cool or good things that you've learned? Maybe the rest of us know it already. Maybe it's a complete shock and surprise. So, uh, well, I, you know, Kirk, I'm sure that uh, many of the experienced engineers out there have uh, uh, run into the same things I have. But uh, for anyone that hasn't, uh, there's a few things that I, I've uh, taken note of. Uh, you know, uh, when I first started 20 years ago, there was still a lot of two-base transmitters out there. And honestly, there still is. There's In our client uh, base, there's uh, more tube transmitters than there is solid state. That's changing every day. Uh, my guys uh, commissioned another uh, new uh, Nautel solid state transmitter today. In fact, mm. at the s same site that Mark Person set me up on my blind date, yeah, to get me into contract engineering. They just replaced a Continental 816 there that's probably uh, well over 30 years old, maybe heading on 40. So I think about the Continentals because when I uh, took over many of the clients that uh, uh, Mark had, uh, which, by the way, I, I, I have to say that I owe Mark Persons my career in uh, broadcast engineering. Uh, he mentored me from day one and and as uh, he uh, uh, worked towards retirement, came to me and said, you know, Jim, this one's a little far away. Would you like to start helping them? So that's, that's how I progressed. And uh, uh, the fleet that Mark was servicing at the time was uh, a lot of Continental 816s. And one tip I have for anyone with uh, Continental 816s, and especially if you have more than one of them, uh, and I have clients that had numerous ones, and one at a time, the uh, the old Continentals come out and probably aren't going to get uh, put back in service, but save some parts. And I'll, my tip on if there's only one part that you save out of a Continental 816, whether it's for yourself or another engineer that needs one, that I have been unable to find are the three, three RPM Hurst motors that are uh, uh, motors with brakes that Continental uses to uh, raise and lower power and to uh, uh, raise and lower filament voltage. And that same motor mm -hmm. also uh, adjusts the uh, uh, PA tuning and loading. So those are worth a fortune. I remember the last time I could even buy one from Continental. What I can't remember. It's maybe been eight, ten years ago. They were over a thousand dollars new. Well, I, uh, as, as old ones have been decommissioned, I've started to box them up and boy, have they come in handy. And, and, and one of the things you asked me about Kirk, Kirk was, uh, you know, what, what are my passions? And I decided, I didn't tell you this yesterday, but one of them is keeping old gear working. And, and there's nothing more than I love, uh, when there's a transmitter, like an old continental that's, that's running good, but something fails. And like, uh, one of these motors, and then a guy has the part or can get the part to fix it and keep it on the air and not have a client have to spend, you know, uh, many tens of thousands or more of dollars buying a new transmitter when they really don't have to. Because, you know, a lot of broadcasters today do need to watch the dollars. I'll, I'll say most of my clients are all, all of my clients are, are good business people. I was talking uh, actually again with Mark the other day, Mark Persons, and we shared our stories about, uh, you know, clients that don't pay bills. And I told him I've never had one in my 20 years that hasn't paid me. And Mark shared the story that that the the only loss he ever had over 40 plus years of uh, engineering was uh, less than $1,000. So, you know, wow. uh, it, and that's because I really believe that most uh, broadcasters in our, well, it really everywhere are, are good business people and doing a good job and, and uh, and I haven't been picky about the clients that I've done work for, uh, you know, so I'm fortunate. I haven't had one that's taken advantage of me. But that's my tip. Save parts 
for keeping what has to be kept on the air going. And when it comes to tube transmitters, you know, just good filament management, and you can get good life out of uh, tubes. And, and we've really learned how to do that. And it's important uh, that the transmitter not just, especially a tube transmitter, just not be expected to sit and run. Uh, if, if an engineer that knows how to keep those transmitters tuned and running efficiently uh, does that, we can get uh, good tube life. The other thing that I found real important on uh, uh, tube transmitters these days is have an inline watt meter on the output because mm. uh, using the uh, using the uh, mathematical calculation to know where power is, uh, if that transmitter is not working right and is not operating efficiently, you can be way off. So it's sure nice to have a a watt meter on those tube transmitters. So uh, you know th those are my tips. Um, as far as uh, what what have I learned to do and and uh, to make life easier down the line, I totally agree. And and the the in the inline watt meter uh, and most of my sites with tube transmitters had had those. Uh, I would add something to that, and that is uh, and you you probably have this anyway. And that would be uh, some kind of a temperature sensor on the oh, yeah. the output on the on the exhaust output. Um, yep. And if you don't have a watt meter. If you have, if you use the indirect method, mm -hmm. and the temperature is what it should be, the temperature rise then, across the tube is what. Then, eh, you good chance the color. rest of it's going out as as RF, right? Right, exactly, and that's very true. Yeah, so that that's the thing to watch when you don't, <clears throat> and that's important. At least a at least a meat thermometer sitting there up up there yeah. on the stack. Uh, and, and and so one of the things that we do that 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 we really enjoy doing is updating sites with new equipment. And I think we and if they, if this is the right time to uh, you let in with the temperature monitoring, and I wrote down a few things that we really do like to do, and that's you know have good remote monitoring. And more and more clients are updating their remote monitoring, and with today's technology, uh, it's real easy to do that. And and then we get to uh, keep close watch on all the parameters of the transfer transmitter, uh, tower lights, uh, a utility power generator, and uh, and then environment. And that's where stack temp comes in. So when we do an install with uh, new modern remote control equipment, we always put a probe on the stack of, well, either the stack of a tube transmitter or even on the top of a solid state transmitter, just to know, is it generating more heat than it should? So uh, we consider that one of our good engineering practices. I would totally agree with that. Um, hey, I'll. Uh, I, I know we've mentioned this before because it was really Chris Tarr who turned me on to putting uh, cameras at transmitter sites. Now that we have mm -hmm. internet available at at many, if not most, if not all of our transmitter sites, um, I, I don't know how well this carries. Now it doesn't carry very well. Let me let me zoom up on this and see if we get any better. Uh, we we <laughs> we buy a, a big twenty dollar thermometer and stick it on yeah. the wall. Oh, right, wonderful. And then the camera idea. can can see that thermometer, right? And so yeah. you, at other sites, we've got it a closer to the camera, but I can see that at uh, WBZK, the buzz in Oxford, <laughs> Mississippi, it is 64 degrees Fahrenheit in the transmitter room. So that's, uh, that that's hunky-dory. Is that the site I remember uh, someone posting a picture of that had a snake crawling over the top of the rack? Oh, well, that's in Mississippi, but that's a difference. That's our, okay. um, we have, of all places, one of the smallest towns in Mississippi is Mound Bayou, Mississippi. Uh, this is a town that was founded by ex-slaves, and the, the town is basically all African-American. I mean, there, there, there's, yeah. there's no white folks that, that live there. Uh, but we have two, not one, but two transmitter sites on the east okay. side of that town. And, uh, and so we, we call them Mound Bayou West and Mound Bayou East. And the, these okay. these two towers, if they fell toward each other, they would just about touch. <laughs> I'll be darned. So, anyway, <laughs> yeah. uh, we we shoot internet a, across the bean field with a couple of little tiny nano bridges from from mm, ubiquity. Yeah. Anyway, very cool. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we Larry Fuss caught uh, a snake. I remember that. <laughs> yes, that's what <laughs> I the remember. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I've been fortunate. We've got uh, 
We don't have, in most of the territory we service, we don't have anything but some uh, garden snakes and things like that. So no, nothing yeah. venomous, especially close to home. But I do, we do get out into the uh, very uh, north, uh, it would be the northeast end of the Badlands, south of Bismarck, North Dakota. And, and I haven't run into any uh, rattlers out there, but I'm told there are a few. So I'm not a fan of snakes. My son will chase snakes. I'll kill spiders. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah. my gosh! Um, so w- yeah, I, I, we can spend a few more minutes chatting about you know what what you like to make sure you get implemented, um, and you're we're welcome to name names just because we're all familiar with a lot of the different brands around here. Sure. What do you like to mm-hmm. make sure you implement remote control wise at your transmitter sites? Well, for quite some time now, uh, uh, we've uh, pretty much exclusively been using the uh, Burke remote control systems. So find them so versatile. And now with uh, transmitters with SNMP, it just becomes so easy. The brand new one in uh, in Nimrod, Minnesota is again, mm-hmm. that's, the, that's the town where the new one uh, finished up there today. Uh, one Cat 5 cable for communicating all parameters, telemetry, remote control. And then one pair of wire for a fail safe since uh, there's a backup transmitter and transmitter switch there. But boy, is that nice having that ability. And uh, and uh, the Burks are just so powerful and, and user friendly. Uh, we just love them. So uh, we've done quite a few. Uh, really, uh, that that's our go to when we're upgrading clients remote control. Uh, mm-hmm. One little uh, thing that we've learned to do. We didn't invent the idea, but we do it. Uh, My uh, tech, Mark uh, Anderson, uh, has gotten quite good at uh, building what we call Burke fan-out panels. We use a 24-port patch patch switch and Mm. uh, fan out all the commands and telemetry. In fact, each channel has uh, one one, uh, metering, one uh, status, and a raise and a lower on a single Cat 5. And uh, it it really makes uh, uh, remote control installations nice and neat. Uh, which mm-hmm. is good and uh, um, uh, also makes it easy to work on and change in the future because we'll mount that patch panel. Typically, if the rack has uh, rails in the back, if need be, it can go in the front, but uh, then you're not reaching in. Uh, nothing worse than reaching inside of a rack trying to get little tiny wires on little tiny screws on the back of a remote control. So that's another yeah. tip. Uh, anyway, yes. Yeah, that and actually that is a great tip. This uh, I got a few sites that don't have rails, rack rails with the screws, you know, on uh, in the yeah. back of the rack, and that yeah. is so helpful. Um, yeah. You know, there's a contract engineer, Mike Patton, and we have mm-hmm. a site where quite a few years ago, um, the uh, we didn't have the Burks at the time. Uh, we we had some leftover sign systems, mm-hmm. and the the remote <laughs> panel for that. It just worked out a whole lot better for um, Mike Patton to put those on the rear. And somehow I need to look, I I never looked to see. He found some kind of a hinge arrangement for them. Okay. So you can undo the racks on one side and hinge it out. And then there are all the relays. Ah. And the in- sensor That's inputs a right there. Great idea. Really? That's like the uh, back end of Continental transmitters, the newer ones. You, you, they had the 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 thumb screws that you could loosen and swing the panel out and get to the stuff that you have used to have to reach all the way through from the front to mm. get to. Yeah, that's a great idea for that. Leave it to Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes some great ideas there. And I tell you, yeah. oh. Now, tell me how you handle this, uh, and I'll, I, I always handle it very poorly. Uh, Mike Patton came in and put um, the overhead uh, wire racks in a in a mm-hmm. multi transmitter site, and this yeah. just made it so good. Some of the coax was too big to run in that, but smaller coaxes yeah. would fit. Uh, certainly, Cat fives and and other control wires would fit up there as well. Do you ever do that kind of overhead? We we, um, we do. Wire? We we uh, yeah. Um, uh, you know, not a lot of new construction uh, these days, some, but a lot of, let's call it reconstruction. And uh, uh, he- here's an interesting story. How many uh, uh, AM radio stations that are directional uh, uh, do a complete rebuild? And here, a legacy radio station that's in the county seat of that Foston, Minnesota is in Polk County, good client of ours, uh, Chris Fee at KROX Radio, Crookston, Minnesota, young broadcaster that uh, 
has a career ahead of him, bought his dad's uh, radio station, and is doing a wonderful job in a small market. He recently completely rebuilt his uh, transmitter site, brand new phaser, brand new ATUs, and so uh, we did that um, to bring the cables into the building. Uh, we, we actually made our own uh, uh, cable ladders to, to bring them from the exterior over to the uh, row where the phaser and transmitters are. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's just good engineering to have your cables in a good, neat way. Uh, you know, depending on the site, uh, it may not be necessary if it's uh, like mm -hmm. some, uh, there's, there might be uh, open rafters in the ceiling and, and then we'll mm -hmm. hang them from there in a, in a good way. But uh, yeah, so we, we definitely like to like to do that, uh, and in some uh, you know rack room, uh, server room builds. Of course, uh, when, when uh, there's a lot of cables, you've you've got to do that. So, yeah, that's a. By the way, those are uh, pretty good call letters there. K R O X, uh, K Rocks. Yeah, um, K Rocks. Years ago, absolutely. Years ago, I did engineering for, and then later on, I ended up owning a piece of W R O X in Clarksdale, yes, Mississippi. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. I've I've seen the call sign. <laughs> hey, um, uh, we're gonna talk. We're gonna take a, a quick break for a a commercial a sponsor. And mm -hmm. uh, Jim, um, if you, you might be thinking about this sponsor, which is uh, well, Broadcast General Store, and we're gonna be talking about Henry Engineering and a product of theirs. But uh, you may want to at the end of the commercial tell us about your favorite Henry Engineering product they do make a lot of things more than they most sure people do. probably realize uh but for the for now let's let's have a look at something that henry makes that i just love and i at, when i first heard about it in fact we had hank landsberg on the show uh a couple three years ago and he talked about this product and i didn't i don't know i didn't have a need for it right then but boy i sure came up with a need for it later on and this is the henry engineering back ups back ups or maybe you want to call it the back ups it's a power controller for ensuring reliable ac power to your critical equipment that's powered by a ups now back ups constantly monitors the output of the UPS and it bypasses the UPS if its output fails or becomes unstable. It has two AC inputs, line, that's for your commercial power that's not on a UPS or maybe on a different UPS, and then it's got a UPS input. Uh, line, you plug that into a local AC socket. Uh, UPS, you connect that to the output of the UPS, obviously. And if the back UPS senses there's any interruption in that UPS uh, output, it switches to line and it bypasses that UPS. It keeps the load powered up and allows the UPS to be disconnected for battery replacement or other maintenance. Now, I'll tell you where else this is really helpful. This is really helpful when you've got um, some, let's say some computers or maybe a Sage or other EAS system. If you've got critical gear and that gear only comes with one power supply, like a computer, maybe uh, at my stations, oftentimes we have um, play out workstations that only have one power supply. Now, the, the server computer, the file server has two. And of course, one of those gets plugged into the UPS and the other one gets plugged into either another UPS or directly to the uh, commercial power. But the workstations themselves only have one, uh, yeah, one power supply. So I put in this back UPS fail safe power switch and I power, of course, one side with the UPS, the other side from commercial power. And that way, if the UPS fails, um, well, guess what? It switches over instantly over to the line input, and that workstation stays on. I have tested it over and over and over again. It works great. Um, the back UPS is, I think, rated for, what, about 15 amps or so? Um, let's see. Yeah, 15 amps. It has a duplex outlet on the other side of it, and it's got uh, it's got some uh, adjustment switches that let you um, change you know the, the amount of time before it returns. Um, it's fully automatic once you install it. The mode switch can select a manual UPS bypass mode or an automatic operation with or without the delay feature, and the back UPS can also be remotely monitored and controlled. So DC output signal is provided to indicate when the UPS is online. And the remote, the remote bypass input allows the unit to be bypassed uh, even by a, a GPS remote control. I love this thing. I didn't think I'd find it useful. And then, bam, I found it very useful at my transmitter site. Uh, and I'll be putting more of these in where we, you know, we have devices that 
only have one power supply and we want to be able to, you know, make sure that they're always on. Uh, and you can get the back UPS from Henry Engineering and any Henry Engineering product from Broadcasters General Store at bgs.cc. That's their website, bgs.cc. You can always call them and I love to call them because they answer the phone and they talk to you at 352-622-7700. That's 352-622-7700. Jim, can I put you on the spot and ask you if you have a favorite Henry <laughs> Engineering product? You took the wind out of my sails. Uh, I, got, oh. I got to admit that that's the one right there. Uh, you know, I was turned on to that by another engineer in a, a market uh, not too terribly far from us and uh, uh, have just fallen in love with them. Just a perfect product for that application. And we'd been looking for something uh, as uh, easy to, to install and simple as that is to do the job. And uh, we put a number of them out. They're now a, a must have on any rebuild that we do with UPS backup. Absolutely. You know, we've used Henry products over the years for, for you know, for, well, since I, I began, I was in, uh, in, in broadcast engineering introduced to the Henry product. So, uh, you know, use the matchboxes, the USB matchbox, the DAs, all of those products. Very well built, very well engineered, very reliable. And uh, now that uh, UPS uh, uh, switch is is uh, is another product that uh, we'll be installing a lot of. I um, was just at one of my stations a few weeks ago, and uh, I was wondering how does that tuner get over to the Axia node input? Let me follow that because the the tuner was an older Rolls brand tuner, mm -hmm. okay. and it didn't have the mm -hmm. um, balanced outputs. It just had the uh, RCA <sighs> connectors. And so yep. I followed it. Oh, it's going through a Henry matchbox that Absolutely. I have forgotten about. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it, it yep. just, you know, it just sits there and runs for years. Yeah, it just so, runs and runs, don't they? Absolutely. Yeah. Good products. Well, thanks again to Broadcaster General Store and Henry Engineering. So I'm, I'm Kirk Harnack. Our guest is Jim Offerdahl, and he is with, uh, he's the senior broadcast engineer. That's because he's the oldest one in the building. Um, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Jim, we've talked about a number of subjects. We still have a cool announcement coming up a little bit later in the show. Uh, <laughs> but for the moment, I want to ask you about um, troubleshooting techniques. Now, I know you take care of some older gear and maybe troubleshooting on that kind of gear hasn't changed much it's a lot of good tribal knowledge that's been learned over the years um oh. but with newer gear or with maybe just uh since you know you and i are both so old and we know a lot mm -hmm. uh what yeah. is what are some of your troubleshooting techniques you've been let's say you're you've been called to the transmitter site uh you're on your way you're in range of tuning in the station what's what are some of the clues you start getting as you're as you're getting close to the station <laughs> well hey we all know what that one is 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 it's off the air but i can hear it <laughs> well exciter is <laughs> yeah. running Okay, probably yeah. not the exciter. So, uh, you know, uh, it, it's just the basics. It's, uh, you know, you always start with the power supply. Uh, that's, that's where most of the problems uh, end up being. Of course, tube transmitters, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the parts that, that wear, tubes, motors, you know, uh, walk in a building. Uh, is it noisy? Is, is the, blower motor getting noisy. Uh, oh, the transmitter has been going on and off. Uh, huh? Are the air filters clean? <laughs> oh, gee, uh, probably should change an air filter once in a while. Looks like this yeah. one hasn't been changed for two years, you know. Uh, so, you know, it's instinct there. And, uh, you know, troubleshooting tips, uh, just got to work through it. You know, it took me a while to really come to understand how to follow a schem schematic uh, and start at the beginning. And if you got it, you got to go in and measure voltages. I, I just spent some time with a, a, a engineer that uh, works for a client and uh, out in Minot, North Dakota. And uh, but, uh, uh, by phone, I, I walked him through. And of course, it takes a certain guy that can understand and follow. And, and he'd probably tell us that he doesn't consider him an, himself an engineer, but the work he did to follow directions and, and do the testing, uh, we found a problem, ended up actually being a mechanical problem with the high voltage contactor. But, you know, mm. you just got to start at the beginning and work you through uh, way through one step at a time until you find the problem. Sometimes it's tough. We got another one that uh, has a high voltage uh, uh, plate supply trips and we're, we're still fighting with uh, what's causing that. And, 
and yeah. uh, trial and error. Sometimes you got to just replace a component. If it's not a real expensive component, I say uh, just just replace it if, if you think it yeah. could be it. You know, a contactor that costs over $1,000, uh, we wanted to make sure that was the problem before, uh, you know, we replaced it. But it was mechanical. It wasn't an open coil. It wasn't, uh, uh, you know, what you'd expect. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, you just got to work through it from the from the beginning to the end until you find the problem. You know, I've got a, a, a an example that can dovetail mm -hmm. with what you're talking. They're a little bit more modern example. Um, I've got a transmitter site, and I won't name any names here, but uh, I've, the the transmitter has an Ethernet connection to the outside world. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, to the local <clears throat> Ethernet switch, and the and it the transmitter doesn't go off the air. But if you look at the logs, the log complains that. Uh, it has lost its Ethernet connection, and every time it does oh. this, it loses it for about two minutes. That's how long, it, mm -hmm. it, two minutes on the log between losing it and it coming back. And yeah. it may go several days with no mm -hmm. problem, and it may right. do it three times, four times in a day. And, yep. um, and so and the, the manufacturer, the transmitter says, well, maybe you got a bad cable. Well, I don't think I have a bad cable. No. Um, no. Maybe you have a bad port on your Ethernet switch. Yeah. Well, okay, maybe it's a brand new Ethernet switch. Could be a bad port, maybe. But you know what, Jim? I just decided. You know what? The Ethernet switch I'm using, uh, it's it's a it's a professional rack mount one, uh, and and yep. it's it's uh, it's it's pro it's manageable. It's a managed switch, but it's not okay. that expensive, and I needed to have a spare anyway. So I just bought mm -hmm. another one. And I pro here at, at the office here where I am. I programmed it because I give it an IP address compatible and do a few more things to it. So this weekend, I'm taking it. I'm just going to swap out the Ethernet switch and see if the condition changes. I don't want to mm. have to fix. I, I, it could be It could be the controller in the transmitter. That could be, mm -hmm. be the problem. Um, mm. And in fact, I kind of think that's what it is. But uh, I'd rather I be proven... Too. I'd rather be proven wrong cheaply than uh, go through yeah. a bunch of rigmarole um, <clears throat> or, and, and, you know, and, and, and be right about it. So anyway, we'll yeah, see. Yeah. We'll see. In, in this day of troubleshooting the modern transmitters, you know, it, it, it's easier in a certain regard because, yeah, you can remote in and you can see a lot of diagnostics in the uh, remote interface. Uh, an issue like that. You know, you just got to work through it again. Yeah, change the easy things. There's the switch. Uh, change it out because, uh, um, you know, no, no, it's not a recognized problem by the manufacturer. And, and you got to get down to where you've uh, eliminated all possibilities. And I've been there and I've done that. And I, I know just exactly what you're dealing with. I'm with you. I think you'll find out it's an issue with the controller, but uh, you know, before the manufacturer is probably ready to, if it's a warranty item, they'll they'll back it up. All the manufacturers are good and offer great support, but uh, they want us to make sure that we've done our job to know that uh, uh, we've uh, eliminated anything outside of the transmitter before they send parts. Talk to me a bit about, uh, well, let's, we haven't talked about studios very much. Your company involved with oh. building and maintaining studios? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yep. What, what are some of the, uh, um, the, the, what are some of the systems that you like? What do you like to install? Uh, you yeah. know, uh, do you make sure you have remote capabilities? So you can help somebody troubleshoot mm -hmm. a computer problem or something like that? Yeah, we, we offer all that support. So, you know, of course, starting in the business 20 years ago, uh, the, the, none of my none of the clients and the and the uh, company here in town had uh, AOIP. But of course, we've grown into that and have done a number of uh, AOIP studio build outs uh, uh, in the last number of years. But uh, still, analog uh, did some uh, uh, some analog rebuilds not terribly long ago. Uh, so we've done that. Uh, uh, but, you know, yeah, we, we, as long as the client wants us to, we actually offer supporting uh, com their, their PCs and uh, uh, get, get remote access where we can remote in. And, and if they've got a, and, and we uh, have used exclusively uh, the uh, Axia product and uh, just love it. And Kirk, you've helped me with that, uh, helped me learn that from the beginning. And uh, uh, when we have remote access to those things, uh, one client was sold on the product because I told them we're going to be able to uh, eliminate uh, the need for 
expensive uh, service calls uh, by being able to do remote support. And we've been able to do just that for them and others that uh, we've done that way. So yeah, uh, still, uh, still a lot of analog studios out there and uh, will probably be that way for a while. Uh, but a number of uh, clients are, uh, when, when they're really ready to uh, get rid of the old racks that uh, I'll, I'll uh, hopefully say, I didn't uh, wire, but you know how it is. Uh, they go through uh, 30 years of different engineers coming and going, and they get pretty messy. So that, <laughs> that's one thing I really enjoy. Yeah. I, I have an absolute ball going in and gutting out a rack and laying all the cable on the floor. And then I go and get the manager and I say, oh, these wires came loose and I don't know where to put them. Do you remember? <laughs> so, no, nope, there's nothing more fun than doing that and cleaning it all up and having a nice uh, serviceable facility for the broadcaster for the next, you know, if it's 20 years or whatever, uh, that might last. Uh, it's, so it's a lot of fun doing that. It may have been after your first big job of ripping out old, unused, mm -hmm. unnecessary wire. But I, but I remember my first job of doing that. It was at WPAD in Paducah, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And there mm -hmm. had been years mm -hmm. of this dear, sweet old engineer, but he never met a, a, a new wire. He didn't he didn't just love to pull. And so yep. um, yeah. uh, the, the, the place had just mm -hmm. gobs of wire. And yeah. and. I started, you know, tracing each and every one, both ends, and oh, yeah. seeing out what what they did. And you know, after about a week of doing that, I it dawned on me, Jim, and you you see if my logic was correct or if I was, you know, could have been made a terrible mistake. If one end of that wire didn't connect to anything, mm -hmm. that wire wasn't doing anything, and it was no longer That's... important. And I could just go ahead and pull it out. <laughs> you exactly. I learned the Is same right? thing. In fact. That very first contract client that Mark <laughs> talked me into taking in Grand Forks got there, no documentation, and five radio stations all uh, connected to the rack room, and no documentation at all. And I, I took a, uh, uh, a three-ring binder and a bunch of paper and started drawing it out and couldn't do it, trace it all at once, but every time I had to go figure out what a circuit was, I said, I got to write this down. It's on this punch block in this room, and it goes to this one in this room. And eventually, you know, I, I, I got what I needed to maintain that facility. Uh, however, that one has since uh, built a brand new building and, and gone all uh, AOIP. But uh, yeah, yeah, definitely have done some of that. Um, we're going to take our, our last break. When we come back from this break, and by the way, I'm going to need you, Jim, during this break. Uh, when we okay. come back from the break, um, we're going to have a little announcement that uh, maybe it's a big announcement. We're going to have an announcement that Jim would like to make, and I think a lot of us in the industry mm -hmm. uh, will be glad to hear uh, what Jim is about to tell us. So uh, just hold your breath. Take out, take, uh, uh, take care. It's, it's going to be uh, two or three minutes from now. We'll, we'll begin that announcement process. Uh, Jim, one of our sponsors is a company that you know something about, and that's Angry Audio. I think both you and I are friends personally with Mike Dosh. And I'd love to see his company succeed and do well. And, you know, I've got um, uh, a little mic processor here, and it's, it's okay. I've got it probably cranked up too much. Uh, but your mic sounds fantastic. You're using a Shure SM7B, but before it gets to your computer to be on this show, it's going through something else. Would you take a minute and tell us about uh, what you're using for mic processing? Aha. Uh -huh. Of course, I have a 7B. And uh, that is the uh, Chameleon Smooth. And I don't know if we can see it, but I'll try. Because I just got to brag about this. If we can see okay. it, it is serial number one. Ah, yeah, over there. Yeah, serial number one. Now, yeah, uh, so I'm minute. pretty I, proud I, of that. I, I, I got a question. I see several um, XLR connectors on the back, but only one of them has something connected to it. What magic is this where you're only using one XLR connector? Well, mic in, and then, of course, yeah. uh, Catfish uh, Studio Hub designed uh, every one of his products now. So I'm coming out of it, Studio Hub, to Studio uh -huh. Hub in on the Angry Audio Analog Audio Gadget, which, boy, oh, boy, I'll tell you what. There was a godsend for interfacing PCs, the uh, USB uh, analog audio 
gizmo. I call it gadget, but that's the gizmo. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, that's all I'm doing coming out of that. And then it's a uh, uh, USB from the gizmo to the PC and uh, works great. Absolutely. Putting a lot of those uh, analog uh, audio gizmos out uh, these days, uh, uh, for sure. And, and, uh, starting to, uh, uh, sell some of the, uh, the smooth processors as well as the, uh, the rebel too. We, we, I owe a little explanation about the, the mic processor that you're using, the smooth processor. It's called mm -hmm. smooth. Uh, the first two letters of the word smooth are SM and it yep. is meant for use with, uh, Sure, microphones, SM microphones, because many of them use a very similar capsule, similar texture, and um, Corny Gould, my, my friend and yours, Corny Gould um, mm -hmm. designed the audio processing in this smooth processor specifically for SM series microphones. Uh, yeah. They can't guarantee how it'll sound on other stuff. <laughs> they say, look, this isn't for everybody. It's for people that have an SM microphone from sure yeah. and and the the algorithms are designed to work that way um and it, it it's very much set and forget you know it it just does a beautiful beautiful job uh it does yeah. have some controls you you, you can tweak it up mm -hmm. and down some but it's it's meant not to be fussed with and once you get a few yeah. things set especially input and output <clears throat> level there you go what else do you have to say yeah. say about that uh processor yeah, yeah. Well, what's so nice about it is, like you said, you set the input and the output, and then uh, room, and, and uh, Catfish called it room instead of gate, and it just makes sense. Uh, you just uh, put your headphones on and listen, and you just turn it enough to have it be quiet, uh, and it really does a nice job. I just love it. You know, I've used a number of other processors, some uh, inexpensive ones, and I've never been a fan of processing. In fact, uh, one of the clients that we took over for Mark Persons, uh, his entire um, uh, he, he owned four markets and uh, he would not have a mic processor, but he had literally every studio wall to wall foamed and they sounded great. Well, uh, this, uh, these processors, in my opinion, uh, take a room uh, without acoustic treatment and make it sound like it's wall to wall uh, foam. So they just, re and, and they're clean. They, they, they just sound so good. It's unbelievable. That's so cool. That's cool. Hey, mm -hmm. Angry Audio is the name. Uh, it's available from many broadcast distributors. In fact, we'll have a little announcement about that shortly. Uh, so check it out from angryaudio.com. And they have lots of other stuff that, that I've sung the praises of too. Hey, our show is also brought to you by <laughs> Max Connect at M A X X K O N N E C T, maxconnect.com. Uh, that's Josh Bone and his company. And they, they kind of got uh, put on the map by their Max Connect wireless service. And they still offer that. I've used it at several times to really get myself out of a bind uh, when I didn't have other internet service and it worked great for us. Um, the thing about MaxConnect wireless service is that it works where in congested areas, a stadium full of people, you get some dedicated bandwidth and a fixed IP address. Well, now MaxConnect is offering another product. It's called the U192. This is, um, it's a USB uh, sound card, if you will, by the way, uh, it's sold by MaxConnect. It, its internals were designed by Mike Dosh at Angry Audio. Uh, but it's sold under the Max Connect banner, and it's an MPX USB sound card. If you are desirous of, of um, running uh, your FM audio processor on a computer, and that computer can put out through USB, uh, the um, the MPX signal digitally, well, this sound card is for you. Uh, for example, if you want to use something like the uh, Omnia SST or the Stereo Tool processor, and I, I, I would think that this also works with the Breakaway processor, um, this will work for you. It's beautiful. Uh, you connect it to the USB, and uh, then it will put out for you analog MPX, and you can go from that right into your FM exciter. It also puts out uh, and takes in digital audio as well. Uh, so it's got several options going on there that you can set from the front panel. Um, but uh, th this is the right way to do it. It was absolutely designed to put out a proper, pure MPX uh, signal, an analog signal to go to your FM exciter from a PC. And by the way, I, I, if you have some qualms about using USB to do that, I got to tell you, um, USB has come a long way, and uh, I I do USB myself on on several 
um, different applications at my stations, and we've had zero problems. We've never had a time where we've had to unplug the USB and plug it back in. Uh, there have been a lot of improvements, especially in the world of drivers for USB. And the drivers now that are built into Windows, for example, extremely stable. And uh, they just tend to work. So if, you, if, if that's a, a qualm for you, put that aside. Check out this U192 MX, MPX USB sound card from Max Connect. Thanks a lot, Josh Bone, Max Connect, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Okay, uh, we've been teasing this announcement. And so, uh, Jim, you, uh, in addition to your <laughs> engineering services, uh, you also uh, are a dealer for some equipment brands that you, you sell to, you know, to your clients and to others. Tell us yep. about that. Yep, and yeah, and we've uh, we've uh, been a reseller of equipment uh, for a number of years. You know, when I first got into the business, Mark Persons was doing that, and he was a dealer for a number of major brands. And uh, then uh, during that time, uh, when it was a brand that Mark uh, handled, we purchased it and had him sell it to our clients. But one day, Mark said. I'm done. I'm going to retire. And Mark did. Uh, and he's busier than ever right now volunteering and with all his hobbies. Uh, but any, in any case, uh, uh, so at that point, we uh, picked up the, the lines that uh, he was uh, selling and uh, have been doing that for a number of years. And uh, it was just some time last year that I realized, uh, and it really came about from my relationship with uh, Michael Dosh and uh, Catfish at, uh, at Angry Audio when we'd been uh, buying product from them uh, from day one. Uh, well, it actually goes back to the Dan Braverman days, my good friend Dan, who uh, I got to know pretty well when Mark retired. Mark was a radio systems uh, reseller. So uh, when that uh, change took place, we, we formed that relationship. And when Dan shocked the world and told him uh, uh, radio systems would be no more and everyone panicked uh, that we wouldn't get Studio mm -hmm. Hub uh, connectors, adapters anymore, of course, uh, the truth is uh, Catfish uh, came to the table and and, uh, uh, and I came along with radio systems. And uh, so we've had a good relationship uh, with Catfish and the Angry Audio products. And and they, they were referring uh, some clients over to me because we actually were stocking a number of their products in our in our shop and uh, and it, and it occurred to me you know there's a bigger market than just the clients we service we would certainly sell our products to anyone that uh, uh, would like to buy them so uh, not quite a year ago uh, my son and I came up with a concept for a uh, a trademark, a brand name, and uh, it's Radio Gearheads. And we kind of mm. soft started it, created a website and a Facebook page and and promoted a little bit and, and uh, have had a little activity and had been talking with uh, uh, some different people about uh, taking on the, the real sales aspect of it, sales marketing and such, because I really don't have time to do a, a real job of that. <laughs> then a good friend of mine that I've known for a number of years from back in his days at Broadcast Depot and then uh, uh, his days at, uh, at uh, Broadcast Electronics uh, uh, was uh, uh, my salesman. And uh, John Lackness uh, came along uh, and uh, was looking for a, a new uh, uh, thing to do here last month. And I pinged John and said, how would you like to pick up the uh, sales management for radio gearheads and by gosh John said I'd love to do it and uh, so he's uh, actively uh, pursuing uh, the uh, uh, different equipment lines that he's familiar with uh, selling in the past that that we didn't already have and of course we have a good lineup of products already so John is the announcement that John will be the uh, National Sales Coordinator for Radio Gearheads, uh, effective immediately. And you'll see our Facebook promotions of that some more, I'm sure. And we might have to do a little promoting here on Twert one of these days, too. And thank you for the opportunity to announce, to announce that here, Kirk. Well, that's cool. I'm so glad, you know, a lot of us in the industry, like John Lackness, love John Lackness. Uh, he's always yeah. uh, jovial, got good things to say at every trade show I see him at. And uh, people who, and I uh, don't know if I've been in his territories or not, but uh, every dealing I've had with him has been good. So, yeah, good. Glad to see him landing with uh, with another good guy, Jim Offerdahl. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks, awesome. Kirk. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, 
Well, Jim, thanks for making the announcement here on this week in, in Radio Tech. We appreciate that. And we got to go. Oh, if you got a tip of the week, I, I, you know, you've given so many tips today. Uh, <laughs> you, got any, you got anything left in you, Jim? Or is that no, it? I, I, well, what's the tip of the week? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> it would be to. when you open up an old uh, transmitter that's got 10,000 volts in it, don't forget to use the Jesus stick. There you go. Don't yeah. use the Jesus stick or you'll meet him. That's right. There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Thanks so much, Jim Offerdahl. Uh, welcome, he is the Kirk. senior Thank broadcast you. engineer at Offerdahl uh, uh, Engineering Services, and we appreciate very much Jim being with us. I hope Chris Tarr is okay. He hasn't checked in. <laughs> I hope it's not in a ditch, but keeping it between the ditches. So let's uh, let's hope that's the case. I'll uh, maybe he'll be back uh, next week. Speaking of next week on this week in Radio Tech, let's see here. I'm sorry I didn't have my calendar right in front of me. Oh, we have. Oh my goodness! Next week, another great engineer where it's warm. Mike Sprzinski, Mike Spry, as many of us know, Mike. Uh, Mike Sprzinski from Orlando, Florida is going to be our guest tomorrow, and he has got some cool things to tell us um, about engineering, uh, what what he's been doing lately. He can talk about that a, a little bit, and I think you're going to enjoy it along with me. So again, thanks to Jim Offerdahl, and uh, thanks to Suncast, our producer, really on top of things today. Really appreciate that. And thanks to um, Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network, where you'll find other good podcasts. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio